together. All right, so today I'm happy to introduce Dr. Frederick Sear. I believe it's Sear. Yes, got it. Dr. Sear is a research scientist at the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Center for DFO. He received a PhD in oceanography from the University of Quebec. He then did two postdocs, one in Texel, Netherlands, and the other one in Marseille, France. In 2017, Dr. Sear began working for DFO as a physical scientist, then as a research scientist where he works closely with the Atlantic Zone Monitoring Program, studying oceanic variability and the relationships between biological, chemical, and physical properties. So now, uh, Dr. Sear, I'll let you begin with your presentation. Um, all right, thank you, uh, Colin, and thank you everyone for uh, being here. Thanks for the invitation. That's pretty, pretty cool to be uh, in person finally after, after a little while. Um, so my talk will be about uh, the ocean climate in Newfoundland Labrador. Um, all right, so here's my outline. Um, very broadly, I'll define what is climate, what is climate change. Then I'll give some uh, basic functioning about the Northwest Atlantic Ocean. Then I will talk about the Atlantic Zone Monitoring Program, which is a, basically the core of my, of my work. Uh, and then I will uh, introduce a new index um, that was developed recently for, uh, for climate studies and ecosystem studies. So uh, first, some definitions. Um, so climate is the description of the average uh, weather for a particular region and time period, usually taken over 30 years. Uh, the reason why we Generally, 30 years is a standard from the, the World Meteorological Organization. The reason we use 30 years is only because it's a, it's a handy time scale for humans, something we can refer to um, when we talk about the changes in, in the weather. Then I would like to differentiate the natural climate change, which occur at multiple time scales from interannual, for example, driven by um, Phenomena such as the North Atlantic Oscillation, NAO, or the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, to something much longer, to millennial time scale, for example, glacial or interglacial periods. Um, so this is a natural climate change. What we hear in the news uh, when we talk about climate emergency, we refer to the anthropogenic climate change, which is related to the uh, human-driven imbalance of the Earth carbon cycle, with a release in the atmosphere of carbon, for example, CO2, that was previously stored in the ground for millions of years under the form of fossil fuels. Uh, going a little bit further into uh, definitions and kind of uh, piggybacking on this, um, I would like to define what is a climatology. So a climatology, or what we consider the normal or expected weather, is uh, defined as the average over a 30-year period, the famous 30-year that I mentioned before. Uh, again, this is a... Uh, WMO, World Meteorological Organization Standard. Every 10 years, we shift our, our uh, reference period by 10 years. Every 10 years, we shift it. So since 2020, we're into 1991, 2020 average as the normal. So using climatology, we can define what is a normalized anomaly. So let X here be any measured variables. Uh, temperature, salinity, uh, sea ice, wind speed, whatever. So if I subtract from X a certain year, the average of, of that variable over the climatological period, then I get what I call the anomaly. So that would inform me, for example, last year was one degree Celsius above average. If I divide this anomaly by the standard deviation of, again, that variable over the climatological period, then I get a unitless quantity called normalized anomaly or also standardized anomaly. Uh, it's handy because, uh, because it's unitless. You can compare different quantities together. You can compare temperature, salinity, wind speed, etc., all over the same scale. In this sense, the scale would be last year was one standard deviation above or below average, for example. Just a quick example of uh, what it looks like. And to illustrate that, this is data from Station 27, which is uh, one of the longest uh, hydrographic times here in Canada, located here just outside St. John's Harbor. Um, what you have here is the normalized anomaly in terms of standard deviation since 1950 
of the average temperature top to bottom January to December. And what we see is that, for example, in the 60s, we were uh, two and a half standard deviation above uh, the long term average, which is based on this period here, 1991 2020. So everything is scaled towards this period, and then we can see the, the cycles in the, in the climate. So this will come back throughout my presentation. So I thought I would introduce that from, uh, from the start. Now let's talk about the kind of a basic functioning of the Northwest uh, Atlantic Ocean. So the, the Northwest Atlantic Ocean, and especially the Newfoundland Labrador Shelf, are a naturally highly variable environment. Um, and to illustrate that, I show you here two um, sea surface temperature composite from satellites. Uh, the first one here is from uh, the two first week of June 2019, and the second one, the two last week of August 2019. So late August is basically the warmest time of the year. And even in the warmest time of the year, we still have close to zero degrees Celsius water flowing on the shelf here. If you look at the color scale, dark blue is close to zero, and purple here is sub-zero. So even in the warmest week of the year, we have this very cold flow along the Labrador shelf, meeting at some point the warm water of the Gulf Stream here, close to 30 degrees Celsius. So in few hundreds of kilometers, we go from nearly zero degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius water, just in the region of, uh, of the Grand Banks and, uh, and, and, and St. Jones. Um, so this region is, is naturally highly variable just because of this fine balance between the cold water coming from the north and, and warm water coming from the south. So any change in the positioning of these current would change the, the ocean climate a lot. <clears throat> and to understand these, these, again, fine balance between the different current, we need to understand the subpolar gyre. So the subpolar gyre is um, kind of this sets of currents here. Uh, there's a Labrador, <clears throat> pardon, there, there's a Labrador current here on the flowing on the on the NL shelf edge here. Then the North Atlantic current, which is the eastward extension of the Gulf Stream, bringing um, warm water towards uh, Europe. And then there's a loop back with the Erminger current, the East and West Greenland current. So this kind of average pattern of the current. Uh, of course, the, the water properties are changing from as as the, the move for, uh, as they complete the loop, but it's basically what is the the average current in the North Atlantic. And the subpolar gyre is set in motion by the mean winds above uh, above the Atlantic, and the mean winds are are, um, are set in motion by the difference in sea level pressure above uh, the North Atlantic. And I try to kind of do a sketch of the, the mean wind pattern here with this arrow. Um, because in, in geophysical fluid dynamics, the mean flow is perpendicular to a pressure gradient. So this in color here, what you have is the um, sea level pressure uh, for this five years average, 2015, 2019. So there's a high pressure here located near the Azores and a low pressure near Iceland. And this pressure gradient here will drive a flow perpendicular to it because of the rotation of the Earth. So this is what we call here the westerlies, and there's a return flow from the Arctic bringing uh, cold air towards our region. So this is basically the, this um, sea level pressure pattern drives the airflow, which in turn sets the subpolar gyre in motion. The thing is that this uh, sea level pressure changes from one decade to the other. Um, and the next slide, I show the sea level pressure anomaly. So the difference between this five year period, the first period is 1965, well, basically the 60s and the 90s. So the first period in the 60s, the low pressure here was a few millibar higher than usual. And the high pressure here was a few millibar lower than usual. While in the 90s, the low pressure was lower, the high pressure was higher, meaning that the difference here is greater. So there's a stronger airflow in the 90s compared to the 60s, for example. Uh, this leads to colder weather in Newfoundland versus warmer weather in the 60s. 
And a kind of handy way to represent these changes is to talk about the North Atlantic Oscillation that you might have heard of. So the North Atlantic Oscillation is just constructed as, a, as the pressure difference between this high and this low. So when it's positive, there's a higher pressure difference. When it's negative, there's a lower pressure difference. Uh, such as in the 90s where there was a positive NAO, so um, colder years. In the 60s, there was a negative NAO, so warmer temperature. So I'll come back to this concept later. But as I said, these changes in the NAO in the wind pattern can change the ocean circulation as well. So in a setup where we have a negative NAO, that would generally lead to a weaker subpolar gyre, such as uh, illustrated here. And when you have a, a positive NAO or a strong airflow, you would have a inflated subpolar gyre. As you can see here, the subpolar gyre is bigger, but more importantly for us, when uh, there's a stronger airflow above the North Atlantic, the labrador current here has a tendency to be deflected offshore. Compared to in a weaker subpolar gyre setup, it has a tendency to loop around the Grand Banks and bring fresh and oxygenated water towards the Gulf of St. Lawrence and, and the Scotian Shelf. And this has some consequences on the ecosystem. In this paper, for example, um, it was shown that uh, the decline uh, in oxygen in the entering Cabot Strait here was actually well correlated with the strand of the Labrador current looping around the Grand Banks. As part of uh, of this, for example, this uh, this setup. Uh, same thing here. Uh, in 2020, uh, there was a CBC article saying that the deep water temperature in the Gulf of Saint Lawrence were hitting scary highs. Uh, we're talking about five or six standard deviation above the average. Something very high. This is because there was less Labrador current looping around and entering La the Lawrence Channel here, and more warm Gulf Stream water entering. So again, this fine balance between the different current uh, in place really influences the, the, the ocean climate and, and the ecosystem. Uh, same thing for the lab, Labrador or, or Newfoundland shelf. And to illustrate one of the difference between, uh, let's say, one period to the, to the other, I, I um, introduce here the cold intermediate layer, or CIL, which is a key feature of the, uh, of the NL ecosystem. And to illustrate that, I show a temperature section along uh, what we call Seal Island section in Southern Labrador here. So this is one of our core um, monitoring uh, section. <clears throat> so what you see here is basically the coast is on the left-hand side. Uh, so this is zero to 300 kilometer offshore. Uh, this is the topography. So there's the shelf is here and the shelf break is just here. And uh, you can see from zero to 500 meter depth. And this is the climatological value. Um, this time is the old climatology, so 1981, 2010, but it's about the same as the new one. Uh, and um, what you see, the dark black contour here is the zero degree Celsius contour. So everything within this black contour is below zero. And we're talking here about temperature in July. That's in, in southern Labrador in July, it looks like this. There's a thin layered surface of maybe reaching 10 degrees, but then underneath, uh, there's a huge volume of water below zero degrees Celsius. So you can imagine that it's quite important for the, the ecosystem. The thing is that from one decade to the other, this cold intermittent layer changes a lot. And I give two kind of extreme examples here. Uh, in the 60s, uh, the, the CIL was almost... Uh, Absent just little pieces here and there, um, which also led to water temperature on the bottom here between two to four degrees Celsius. If you look at 1990s here, uh, the CIL was was huge. It was also cold because this darker shade of blue here is minus one degree Celsius. So again, most of the water, subsurface water in the 90s, were occupied by water below minus one degree Celsius in the summer. And also in the seafloor where you have below zero, below one degree Celsius water in the, on the seafloor. And the bottom here is the climatology that I already introduced. So from one decade to the other, huge changes. And you might have guessed it, 
these changes are mainly driven by uh, what's happening in the atmosphere. Uh, in the case of, a, for example, um, negative NAO setup, you would have tendency to have this, and a positive NAO setup, you have a tendency to have this. You have to note, however, that one year is not sufficient. You need multiple year, you know, multiple year one after each other to generate this whole water volume and to to shrink it. So the 1990s corresponded to the to the collapse of the groundfish fisheries, uh, which was a, a trauma for the for for the region here, uh, and for most of the the Atlantic Canada. So following that collapse. Um, because it was also coinciding with a period of very cold condition, the Atlantic Zone Monitoring Program, or AZNMP, was created in 1998. Uh, and this is the core, uh, well, one of the core aspects of my, of my job is to work for this program. Um, so, as I said, there was a proposal for a Northwest Atlantic uh, Monitoring Program in 1998. So, that's the kind of uh, funding document of the Founding document of the of the A's and MP. And in the very first paragraph of that document, it says that changes in climate cannot be ignored as an explanation for fluctuation of in marine resources. But it was really the, the idea of creating this monitoring program is to monitor the environment to better inform fisheries management. Um, and since this time, we produce um, us. Uh, uh, researcher associated to the AZNMP, uh, every year a report on the oceanographic condition in the Atlantic zone. So this zone has researcher from Newfoundland, but also uh, the Scotian Shelf here and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And not only the physics, but also uh, biology and biochemistry um, uh, components. So we all gather together once a year and we produce this report where we basically describe the ocean conditions. So, uh, coming back to, uh, to this, uh, you know, kind of stuff that we can, uh, we can, uh, inform, uh, as part of the A's and MP. So I bring back this figure where, where I mentioned that bottom temperature here was, uh, very different from the sixties and the nineties. Uh, we can also actually measure bottom temperature since, um, since the, the early eighties. Uh, since we have a instrument, temperature and, and salinity uh, instrument on the trawl, on the scientific trawl that we use to, to assess the, the resources. So each of these dots here corresponds to a, a place where we measure um, temperature on the seafloor. From this, you can uh, get basically a picture of what is the temperature on the, on the bottom. Uh, this is for 2019, for fall 2019. And the, the middle panel, the left panel is the climatology, so the 30 year average of the bottom temperature. And every year we can contrast uh, a certain year versus the climatology and get the anomaly here. So red usually means that it was warmer than usual. Uh, so that's for 2019. Uh, the reason why, there's two reasons why I, I, I wanted to, uh, to show this specific example for AZMP. The first one is to show that bottom temperature, like any other variable, changes on the decadal time scale. Here you have a time series that starts in 1980 to 2020. So you have 40 years of data. And you can see that we went through this cold period in the 90s, and then a warmer period that peaked in 2011, and kind of back to close to normal, although recent years were again starting to increase. So looking at that, so that's the first reason that I wanted to show this, this Specific example is that climate is fluctuating. The second example is uh, looking at that, you can think, well, this is anthropogenic, anthropogenic climate change. Uh, the ocean is warming. And fair enough, we only have data since 1980. But I want to emphasize here the importance of long time series and, uh, and of monitoring programs such as the AZMP. So we don't have bottom temperature before 1980, but we do have data, as I mentioned before, at station 27, which is again, one of the longest time series in, in Canada. Uh, and if, if we compare these two, we, they track each other very well, even though this one is only the bottom and this one is the average temperature for the entire water column. 
What uh, station 27 informed, however, is that the 60s was actually probably the warmest period. So just looking at the zoom in the recent years, we don't see uh, the full picture. And, and actually, this is part very likely of a natural uh, cycle in, in, in bottom temperatures. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, um, long time series are important. Uh, they're important to inform uh, ecosystem uh, research. So in, um, actually, I must admit, I was pushed by a lot of my peers to come up with some uh, kind of simplified indices uh, that they can relate the climate to the fisheries or to the ecosystem. So last, well, this year, 2021, we came up with a, a climate index and I will finish my talk talking about uh, this index. So the Newfoundland Labrador Climate Index is basically a composite of 10 different sub indices. These sub indices are, uh, I don't know if you can see from, the, from there, but the winter North Atlantic oscillation, or like the atmosphere setup in the winter, uh, then the air temperature at five sites, so Nook in Greenland, Iqaluit, Baffin Island, Cartwright in Labrador, and Bonavista St. John's. Uh, the sea ice in three boxes, so um, in purple here, so Northern Labrador, Southern Labrador, and Newfoundland. Uh, the number of icebergs uh, crossing a line here at 48 degree north. Then from station, uh, the sea surface temperature in these black boxes here that are the NAFO divisions. Uh, also from station 27, I have temperature salinity and the minimum temperature of the CIL, so the coldest water we can get. I also have the uh, average, the, the area of the CIL over a hydrographic section, so Seal Island, Bonavista, and Flemish Cap. And finally, the bottom temperature in these NAFO divisions again, but clip at the at the shell break. So each row here uh, represent one of these uh, sub indices, uh, color coded according to whether or not it was warm, red, or cold, uh, blue. And the, the 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 deeper the color is, the more standard deviation above or below the average we are. So. Uh, and, and when it's gray here, it's because there's no, there was no data. The, for example, this time series started later. So all these uh, basically lines are collapsed into a, uh, a stack bar plot here to, to visually better see fluctuation in the, in the climate since 1950. And the average of, of, this, um, of this index is again presented at the bottom here uh, where is the average of the 10 time series? So that is the basically the, the climate index. Um, and again, color coded according to the standard. So we can say, uh, let's have a closer look at the uh, NL climate index. So we can say many things. First of all, as I said before, strong decadal variability of the of the climate in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. And this climate, this uh, climate variability is linked to, to as I said before. This kind of fine balance between the water coming from the north and the water and the warmer water coming from the from the south. We can also say that the mid 80s, early 90s was the coldest decade in uh, the last 70 years. This is pretty clear here if you look at all these blue cells here and all these uh, this bar going down. At contrary, the 60s were the warmest decade, uh, <clears throat> as you can see here and here. It was uh, highly driven, uh, though, by the cold intermittent, a very warm cold intermittent layer. Uh, as I said before, so that was the 60s where there was almost no CIL versus the 90s where it was much, much bigger. Uh, also, we can see a decreasing sea ice uh, since the beginning of the record in 1969. As you can see here, so we're a lot of blue. Blue means colder, and we slowly warmed up. Uh, with some, there was a previous record in, in 2010, but actually 2021 that is not there, uh, set the new, uh, the new record. And finally, as I mentioned, the large scale forcing, for example, the winter NAO really sets the stage for most of the parameter for the rest of the year. Uh, and again, I illustrate here where we have a period of 
Now it's red, but it's a negative NaO because red is negative NaO is warm. So we have this, and then a positive NaO here, where we lead that leads to a like a succession of positive NaO would lead to a to a cooler climate. So there's many thing, many other things I, I, I yeah as I mentioned here. So negative NaO leads to this, positive NaO leads to this. <clears throat> so there's many other things I could I could say about that, um, but I. I'll switch to uh, something else now, which is the biogeochemical response. And we can only talk about biogeochemical parameters since uh, the introduction of AZNMP in, in 1998, 1999, where we started this kind of measurements uh, on a regular basis. So we'll focus more on the, the recent period. And I will just give you two examples of ongoing work um, uh, where I what you, what you see here is a plot of the NLCI, so the NL climate index, versus the timing of the initiation of the bloom. So in blue, you have period of warmer climate that are delineated by red bars here, and the timing uh, of the bloom for the entire region in orange. So what we see is that when we have a warmer climate, we have a uh, an earlier bloom, so negative anomaly in the bloom means earlier, and vice versa. So, in other words, cooler NL, later bloom, and vice versa. It's not really surprising, but what is surprising is how much predictive power we have with the climate index to the, the bloom initiation. We also have a good predictive power of the climate index on the abundance of Canonus finmarchicus, which is one of the key taxa for, um, for the ecosystem in there. Uh, and then same thing, a cooler NL shelf mean lower abundance of kelvin and vice versa. So as I said, this is very, very fresh work that I um, added to my presentation. Um, I give another example of stuff that has been published earlier this year where the NLCI, the NL Climate Index, has a good predictive power on the timing of the spawning of Capelin. Um, it was not, in terms of the environment parameter, that was the best uh, parameter to predict the, the timing of the spawning. So uh, that's, uh, that's it for me. Uh, so this, I really wanted to introduce this climate index uh, because it is um, openly accessible. So if you, if you are doing any ecosystem study and you wanna have a broad overview of the, uh, the climate in, in Newfoundland Labrador. Uh, you can have a look. Um, it is available on the FRDR, so Federated Research Data Repository. So if you Google uh, NL Climate Index FRDR, you should find it. It's also available on the CUS Atlantic, hosted here at MI. Um, in the repository, you'll find the climate index itself, so a single time series, but you also find uh, all the fields, so the 10 sub indices are there. So you can basically make your own climate index by cherry picking the indices that you're interested in. Uh, and finally, there's a, there's a paper that explains basically each of the sub indices uh, and, and give basically uh, graphs of, of all the parameters and what they, what they, how they, they evolve over the last, uh, last few decades. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much for listening and for being here. And uh, yeah, so I, I acknowledge here uh, help from many, uh, many uh, colleagues that helped me brainstorming with this, uh, this climate index. Uh, but I also really want to thank the, all the ASNMP staff uh, that make uh, this possible. So thank you. And thank you so Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll field the questions online. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can stay in the camera. We're still trying to figure this part yeah. out. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Not used to in person anymore. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions online, go ahead and just raise your hand. Go ahead, Dad. Yeah. So should I repeat the question maybe? Uh, so the question oh, yeah. is, if uh, all sub-indices are equally weighted, 
in the climate index? And the answer is yes. So, that, I mean, there's many argument to think that maybe iceberg is less important than sea ice or, or bottom temperature, but uh, there was no really good argument to how to weight this. <laughs> so they're equally weighted, but then again, because I provide them all, one person can decide to weight them different. With the last, yeah, yeah, yeah. In recent years, yeah, in twenty since twenty twelve, uh, there was an ongoing uh, positive phase of the NAO. So positive means cool, cooler water. And your question is why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, actually, there was some. Uh, th there's different reason for that. There's the choice of, uh, of, uh, maybe I should, we can see it all now. So there are some, uh, some blue that you can see, uh, the sea ice and iceberg were red. So it's something with ice. So, um, basically there was an ongoing positive phase of the NAO that really looked like the one of the 90s here. But the response of the ecosystem was not the same, or the response of the environment. Uh, we think it is because of, this is the anthropogenic climate change signature. So winters are milder, so sea ice is still decreasing despite of, uh, of warmer condition, um, and also sea surface temperature, because sea surface temperature is is mostly um, uh, mostly corresponds to the summer conditions, and since the atmosphere seems warmer in the in the summer, then the thin layer gets um, gets uh, warmer than uh, than usual. Uh, but if we look at the CIL, for example, that is the leftover from the previous winter, the CIL was actually cooler in the recent period as a as a consequence of the this positive NAO. For example, here you see the negative, the cool CIL in response to this really cold annual. Or not? Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't mention, but it's uh, December, March. Yeah, so there, it's a very interesting question. So it was my um, question was on um, this, uh, this basically figure where most of the stock assessment are based on basically baseline is basically the pre collapse in the 80s. And this figure showed that actually the, the 60s was one of the warmest period and something we never take into account. And, and, and this is specifically something that I've been hammering over uh, many years since I started at the FO. For me, it's, it's, this is mind blowing that the 60s were the warmest period uh, in the last century, basically. So, was it possible that our, our, we're a bit biased when we think about our baseline? 
Uh, what I think, and again, this is, uh, doesn't involve DFO, it's a personal uh, interpretation right now. What I think is that, uh, you know, when we're fishing a lot of, uh, you know, the, the kind of industrialization of the fishery started in this period where it was potentially a, a, an anomaly over the last, uh, in the last century. And if, yeah, we industrialize our fishery uh, and we had record uh, uh, record fishery, but yeah, this was based on an anomaly. And then once this anomaly was gone, then the, the ecosystem uh, responded to, to to something, but we kept the fishing pressure as high as it was there. So that would be my uh, hypothesis, not hypothesis, but my analysis of this, but uh, yeah, again, it's a completely personal analysis. All right, uh, we have a question from Nancy online. If you can unmute yourself, go ahead and ask it. All right, thanks. Um, thank you for the presentation, Fred, very interesting. Um, I was wondering if in the ZNP data, if there's a way or if you're able to determine transport through some of those um, transects. Yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's a good question. I mean, we, uh, there's a lot of paper that have been trying to compute geostrophic transport from a historical transect. Um, what I've heard, I've, I didn't try myself. What I've heard is that it's quite difficult because of, uh, of the, basically the, the, the tidal aspect and the variability, uh, high frequency variability of the, of the transport it makes it very difficult. Uh, but yeah, again, I'd be happy to uh, to try that. I know Thanks, our friend. colleagues. And then just if I could, what? Sorry, I didn't. I don't understand. But yeah, well, I think our colleague Steve also is trying to uh, try to do this uh, recently. I had I had one right. more question, Fred. If you could, um, I was wondering if I mean you're looking at your work in the connection um, between the. Newfoundland the climate index and the Capelin spawning time. Have you looked at the results for this year? I think if I remember correctly, the Capelin did spawn earlier than in the past few years. So I'm just kind of curious what how things are looking. Well, I can say it matches. I didn't check uh, the details because again, it was kind of a one year where the after like 30 years being delayed, the Capelin came back to uh, almost uh, what it was before the collapse. But 2021 was one of the warmest year. Um, uh, in uh, in a long time, at least since 2010. So, yeah, this year is definitely uh, an outlier. Uh, so, yeah, warmer climate. We came back to earlier spawning, so it, it matches. Cool. Thanks, Fred. All right. Do we have any more questions? Oh, great. Right Yeah, so there was two questions. The first one was uh, if we see uh, increased freshwater input uh, as a result of a uh, Ice melting in, in the Arctic, for example, and the answer is uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, uh, the more complex answer is I'm not sure if it's. I mean, worse now than it was, uh, for example, in the 60s. Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, in, in the recent years, yes, there is definitely a freshening that we see. Uh, not sure if it's because the Arctic is melting or because of this kind of a NAO pattern that brings uh, more or less uh, fresh water from the Arctic. Uh, because the, the Arctic acts, uh, acts as a buffer also for fresh water. So sometimes it retains water for a few, few years and then it releases it afterwards. So I'm not so sure, but yes, we see a freshening over the recent years. Second one is that if there's potential for forecasting the ocean conditions, um, yes and no. In the sense, if you just look at this figure, you can see that these are slow cycles. So, of course, you might have one anomalous year once in a while, but I think we can forecast them because these are, are cycles. Uh, so, definitely, we reached a peak here around 2010, 2011, and now we've been cooling, and I can at least based on 2020 and 2021, we're back towards a, an increase. Um, how long it's gonna last, I'm not sure, but what you can say is that, uh, and, and the reason why these cycles are so slow is because they're kind of, kind of inertia in the system. This, you know, when you build this volume of cold water, you cannot get rid of it from one year to the next. So this is why there's kind of low frequency pattern because of these, of this kind of buffering effect of how much cold water you have in the system versus uh, versus none. So in this aspect, yes, there is some kind of predictive power because uh, we know that these cycles are relatively slow. Any more questions? All right. I think that about wraps it up. Um, yeah, so next week's talk is gonna be uh, Dr. Andrea uh, Brindam uh, Buchholz on marine ecosystem impacts and management responses under 21st century climate change. And she actually works as a postdoc here. And uh, yeah, and I want to give a final thanks to our uh, presenter, Dr. Frederick Sear. Uh, thanks Thank for you. joining us and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Okay.